him 528, oh, for a thousand songs to sing, we don't take him today. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sin. As a call and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the room, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here the worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
On this Sunday, you will hear that both the Old Testament lesson and the Gospel reading have a great deal to do with marriage. And so we begin with Genesis 2, verses 18 to 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. This is the word of the Lord. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. The Epistle from Hebrews, chapter 2. Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You crown him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. We see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, and bring many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For you as sanctifies, and those who are sanctified, all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Here ends the reading of the epistle lesson. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for now. Hallelujah, let the children come to me. 
do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. <laughs> came up in order to test Jesus asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. The disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child cannot enter it. He took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Here ends the reading of the Gospel lesson. This is the Gospel of the Lord. something has gone badly wrong in society with regard to family marriage, you must be like the ostrich with his head buried in the sand. 
Much is being said about marriage and the relationship of marriage these days that really is beyond debate if we simply turn to the Word of God. There are so many younger and older couples who choose to live together rather than make a commitment to see God's blessings in marriage. Pornography is one of the biggest industries in the world. And why do we treat children in the womb as either a person or not a person, depending on not whether the mother wants to bring the child to term? Why is Minnesota one of the most open states in the abortion industry? How well, we reached a point where casual sexual relations become widely regarded as a recreational activity. We enjoy whenever and wherever you can find two or more willing consenting adults. Why are SDIs exploding in senior communities? Casual sexual relations have become rarely regarded as something to do in their spare time, unaware that they are even infected. The casual approach to sex has even gone down into elementary schools. Why the huge escalation in divorce? Pick up the Steel County Times and you look at the divorce statistics, the marriage statistics. I did that this week for May and printed in there. And they're almost the same. The same number got married and the same number got divorced. Why are there so many few, few children and families that could be blessed with more deliberately choose not to have them? Why do so many, even our churches, under the satanic twisting of our Lord's word, judge not? close their eyes to much of what is going on even within their own church. It really goes back to the serpent's question to Eve. Did God really say? That's always the first question by which Satan plants the seeds of doubt into our heart and our mind about how to live out our life. He proceeds to use that question, did God really say, to flat out eventually contradict God's word to you tactics have not changed since the time he came and kept Eve in the Garden of Eden. What has happened to us as a society is that we have been seduced first into doubt and then into disbelief about God's word. The word about family, about marriage, about children. All of them are special objects of Satan's hate because all these find their foundation in God's will and plan for the human race to bring us blessing. Make no mistake about it. Holy Scriptures reveal God's plan for the human family. Marriage and family are not a social construct, something that we dreamed up. Because we didn't dream them up, God established them. We don't get to define them as we want to. God establishes the definition. You heard that today in the Old Testament reading. Marriage is not Adam's idea. Marriage is God's idea and his gift. God had kindness and compassion upon Adam. He saw that he was alone. And so God created a helper, a woman to be for the man, so he would not be alone. He brought the woman to our first father, and he gave her to her, and to him and Adam received her as a gift. Moses concludes in the Old Testament reading, Therefore a man shall leave his father, his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What does that mean? One flesh. One flesh is defined as a single organism. Where there were two before, now there is but one. Some of the church fathers described it in this way. You have a lock and you have a key. By themselves they're useless, but put together they become useful. Or a violin and a bowl. By themselves they're useless, but when you bring them together, the violin and the bowl, they make beautiful music. That's what it means to be one flesh. Either one is incomplete without the other, but together they make something new. And that is the Lord's will and the Lord's plan. Male and female, a man and woman given to each other the nucleus of a new family. And when two become one, the Lord often delights to give you more gifts and gifts of children. They are not in the Lord's wisdom to be thought of as a burden Blood and blessing. You heard that in today's introit. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Blessed is the man that fills his quiver with them. So far, God's plan. But you don't have to read very far into Scripture before you see that institution of the Lord given for our benefit and blessing 
comes under attack. Those of us who in the education have been reading through the Old Testament, we're just getting started in our study guide. See polygamy and faithfulness, concubines, family dissensions, fights, murder, and bloodshed occurring so soon in the Old Testament. The pages of scriptures are literally filled with the damage inflicted on the human race with the unflagging assault of Satan on his good gift of God and are buying into his lies. Now, all of that has already been going on for thousands of years. And the Pharisees came to Jesus in today's gospel seeking to trap him on the mess of God's own people in native marriage. And yet the most important verse in our text to understand it is omitted in the reading for today. Verse 1. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. The crowds gathered him again as again was his custom. He taught them. This gospel lesson takes place in the very territory of Herod Antipodus. He who took his brother's wife as his own, despite the warnings of John the Baptist that that was not lawful. The result was John's arrest and eventual beheading. And now Jesus in that same territory, addressing the same topic, had gone there John the Baptist into hot water in the first place. So they come up in an order to test our Lord, ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Notice the sentence there. They came up to test him. They didn't go up to him and ask him what God's will was. They didn't ask him what his opinion was. They came up to test him, knowing that they could test him, and perhaps he would fail. After all, would he stand like John the Baptist and say, this is wrong? Or would he yield to popular opinion? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He asked them, what did Moses command you? Did Moses allow a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away? But Jesus regards even these words of Moses in Deuteronomy that prevented divorce under certain circumstances to be really a concession to the hardness of the human heart. He says in response, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, and the two shall become one flesh. They no longer two but one flesh. But therefore God is joined together, let not man separate. And the disciples just struggled with that Lord's Adam and insistence that divorce is not the will of God. That it undoes what God himself has done in uniting together the man and the woman. They asked the Lord in effect if he really meant it. His words are uncompromising, however uncomfortable that might be. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Now, she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. But let's take that word adultery and let's take it apart for just a second this morning. What does adultery mean? It means to look at another. That's what adultery is. Instead of looking at your spouse, you begin to look at another. That's the first step. That's what adultery is, to look at another. Sometimes adultery is not so much adultery as it is desertion. Instead of looking at your spouse, you begin to look at nothing. You're not looking at her any longer. Some of the church fathers said that was harder than adultery to bear. When a man would just simply ignore his wife and, in a sense, desert her. But whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Jesus allows no wiggle room in today's gospel. And like us who find wiggle room around God's commandments in every corner. Jesus doesn't think about marriage the same way we tend to. In historic Christianity, the churches are regarded divorce as something to be avoided. As cutting up a living body the kind of surgical operation. Some have thought the operation is so violent that it can't be done at all. Yet others admit that perhaps at appropriate times in a desperate situation, it is something that could, could actually be done. But they all agree, though. All the church fathers agree that even if you allow a divorce, it's more like having both legs cut off rather than merely being a simple separation. 
having both legs cut off certainly implies that that relationship can no longer continue, that a relationship is permanently and forever hindered. Most people today, if they are honest, would say, yeah, I know of places where divorce might be permissible. It might make sense. It might be the right thing to do. But the Lord doesn't seem to get that at all. He doesn't seem to have an exception clause in mind. If we grasp the answer to that question, we'll understand our relationship to our Father in heaven, to our Lord, in a new light. Why doesn't Jesus get divorced and understand it like we do? Why is he so adamant that he is not permitted? Because God does not give up on relationships. Jesus does not give up on relationships. That would be contrary to his nature. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Lord couldn't and wouldn't back off of his promises to us. They hold forever. He looks at you. And he never stops looking at you. He's not going to look at another. He's not going to simply stare off into space and ignore you. He looks at you. And he always will. Our Lord Jesus comes into the flesh to win you a bride for himself. A bride whom he will be faithful forever. The problem is a hard heart. Jesus puts in our flesh a tender heart. God put Adam to sleep and took from his side that which he made a woman. So the Lord Jesus sleeps in death on the cross and his tender heart is pierced. And from that heart flows out blood and water. As long as the church seen in the water and blood of our Lord, a picture of both baptism and the Lord's Supper, where the Holy Spirit creates the bride of Christ and brings her to the bridegroom. And that your bridegroom, your Jesus, is faithful to you, for his heart is not hard. He looks at you all with patience and loving kindness that have no end. He is faithful even when you are faithless to him. Thank goodness that Jesus doesn't get divorced. It makes no sense to him, because in his heart is a divine love that will never let you go. It will never let you go. He will never stop looking at you. He will never shift his eyes someplace else and become unaware of what's going on in your life. He doesn't divorce himself from us. He always is looking at us and watching over us. He's unwilling to lose us no matter what. That same divine love that had no patience with the disciples trying to block the little ones from coming to him for his blessing. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. The divine love that does not give up, doesn't get giving up, and will stand no barrier between you and him. All of this, you see, is taking the way God, not we, not Adam, not our society, will go design the institution of marriage and family. You see, our Lord is adamant about this because he wants to understand for us to see that marriage and divorce are really a picture of our relationship with him. And he will never divorce us. He will never look someplace else. So when you read those words of scripture from the Old Testament lesson, from the gospel lesson today, think not only about marriage between man and a woman, but think about the relationship you have with your Father in heaven is established by Christ our Lord. For the ending in this sad world, it can bring hope and a future to counter the mess we have made trying to do marriage and family on our own terms because of the hardness of our hearts, thinking we know better than God, it is the open heart of Jesus. His open heart mirrors for us the Father and reveals the unfailing love of God, his patience and loving kindness toward us that have no end. And let no one think this morning that there is no one who understands what I'm going through. Look at the epistle lesson again. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Help comes quickly. Where am I going to find that help, Pastor? Where am I going to find that help to deal with the temptations that come my way? Well, right here. Here is where you find that help. Over there stands the baptismal font. That's where you were married to our Lord in the waters of your holy baptism. 
you became his bride, and he is the bridegroom. Today you come to the Lord's altar, and there he feeds you. He feeds you his body and blood, that he might strengthen you for the life that you have to live in this world. Oh, our Lord's not innocent about what goes on in our lives. He knows we live in a broken and hurting world. He sends his body and blood to us to strengthen us, to renew us, and to give us a new life. A new life that sends us out forgiven and renewed, to be enduring in our families and our neighborhood the divine love of the bridegroom who holds us fast to become one with us forever. So when you leave here this morning, having received the body and blood of our Lord, know that he comes to you to hold you fast forever, and he will not let you go. He'll not divorce himself from you. He'll not look off into the wilderness. He'll not look for someone else. He's always looking at you. He's got a hold of you. He looks at you, and he's going to see to it that you are, behind, are with him in heaven. And there you can look at him and be filled with all joy. And God preserve you in that one true faith for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and the life everlasting. Amen. Having heard the word of God, we stand and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, but for the resurrection of the dead, life in the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, and God's people may be strengthened in true faith and for his kingdom extended. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the only Christian church throughout the world, for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world and our sinful nature, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For this congregation, its mission, and its people for the ability to meet the needs that arise and do the work God has given us to do. And for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Well, look, all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, then their eating and drinking, they may receive the forgiveness of, it, so forgiveness of sins, the renewal of life, and have a foretaste of the feast that to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For those who have wandered from the faith, the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For the government and all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably, and for the good of the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts, and sciences, 
that God would grant them skill, integrity, and the performance of their responsibilities and valued service through their vocations. Let us pray to the Lord. Go to your mercy. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, and unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For all the faithful, the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the body the Lord provides. To support the church and help those in need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For those who are sick, that God would grant healing to their bodies and strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. For those who mourn, that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope, rely on God's promise that he will never leave them or forsake them, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. For those who rejoice in the rich blessings of God, they may always remember the giver of every gift and give him heartfelt thanks, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. O well, Lord, we pray this day for those who labor in the fields during this harvest season, that you may watch over them, and that no accidental death from harvest may befall upon our community. O oh Lord, in the midst of the harvest season, may we always give thanks for your great goodness to us. And may we always remember that harvest time and seed time and the seasons will not change. You promised that to us, and we are encouraged day by day by your helpful promise to us about the need for our daily food. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, we're grateful to remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation, rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead. We draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb this kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayer, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We extend God's peace to each other. Will the words peace be with you? All right. Peace be with you. Should be seated as the offering is brought forward. <laughs> Stand and sing the offertory. What shall I render?
It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. In the community of all your saints gathered in the one body of your Son, you have surrounded us with so great a cloud of witnesses that we, encouraged by their faith and strengthened by their fellowship, may run with perseverance the race that is set before us. And together with them receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, God, and magnify your glorious name. The Lord praising you and saying. Son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. By faith, the saints of old held fast to your promise of things hoped for, though not yet seen. Leave an example of encouragement for us who walk now by faith and not by sight. Grant that we may faithfully eat and drink this holy supper of your Son's body and blood, and in the union of his mystical body, the church, be joined in unending praise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and Elijah, and all the faithful prophets. Blessed apostles and evangelists, the holy martyrs, and all the saints in glory who fought the good fight of faith before us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he betrayed to bread, when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave his disciples, said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. It's due in remembrance of me. Same way also he took the cup after supper. When he gave it thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it with all of you. This cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, is do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you, keep you in the one true faith and the life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. suffer your son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith through our days of pilgrimage. On the day of his coming, you may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb of his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Cleanup is scheduled for 5.30 tomorrow evening, meeting at uh, SETI Sports Center, and then we'll clean the ditch there. So anybody that can help, you're welcome to attend. 5.30 tomorrow. Thank you.